The fact is this. Uh, we went to Afghanistan 20 years ago, and we went because we were attacked on 9-11. And we went to take on those who had attacked us on 9-11 uh, and to make sure that Afghanistan would not again become a haven uh, for terrorism directed at uh, the United States or any of our allies and partners. And uh, we achieved the objectives that we set out to achieve. Uh, Al-Qaeda has been significantly degraded. Its capacity to conduct an attack against the United States now from Afghanistan is not there. Uh, and of course, Osama bin Laden was brought to justice 10 years ago. So the president felt that as we're looking at, at the world now, we have to look at it through the prism of 2021, not 2001. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis. That was U.S. Secretary of State Lincoln justifying a decision to pull out the last U.S. troops from Afghanistan. And he's putting a good face on what may be a very bad decision. There are not many people I can say as a TV correspondent I flew with them in a Black Hawk helicopter across the mountains of Afghanistan to forward operating bases where American soldiers fought to capture or kill insurgents. Major General Jeffrey Slosser was the commanding general in charge of the 101st Airborne in eastern Afghanistan. And during our journey through a war zone, I think he was thoughtful, sincere, and completely frank about combating a surge in violence and the U.S. strategy to win the war. That was in 2008. And now in 2021, the year the U.S. administration ends the American troop presence in Afghanistan, General Slosser has written a book in which he predicts abandoning Afghanistan now won't end well for Afghans or for Americans. But he says the war, despite everything, in the end was worth it. Jeff Schlosser is a retired major general who commanded the 101st Airborne. 15 months of that command was in Afghanistan, and he is the author of a new book called Marathon War. And he joins me now. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Dan. How are you today? I'm very well, and thanks for talking to us about this. It's a great book. The curtain is closing on that war, and you wrote it was worth it. Was it really? Great question, Dan. And it's one that I think we're going to continue to you know, grapple with over the next decade. Um, you know, we went in there to do a very specific thing in the first first year, which was really to bring justice on those that attacked our country in 9-11. And uh, what we found out is, is that as we pushed out Al-Qaeda and either captured or killed them or gave them a chance to uh, reconcile, that what we found there was a land that uh, was a potential, not only was it a failed state, but it was a safe haven. And so we had to stay longer. And uh, the question of it is, is now as we withdraw, did we stay long enough? You ended with a warning. If we let that country go back to those who would destroy us in our way of life, it will not be long, certainly not a generation, before they come looking for us again. Yes. In Marathon War, I say basically that, you know, we can turn our back, we can forget Afghanistan, but Afghanistan will not forget us. And I truly still believe that. Um, the area there is so important to our national interests, uh, but it's also, as I said, it's, a, it's now going to, I, in my mind, be a failed state. And if that actually happens, They'll come to see us again. You think it's going to crumble, that the Afghan army will not hold, that the Afghan government will not stick like glue? Not that it has anyway, but you, you feel pretty dire about how this is going to unfold once U.S. forces and NATO forces and other contributing countries are out of there. I think that, you know, the United States and uh, NATO are allies there, as well as all the other countries that have participated over the last 20 years have been the backbone for Afghanistan. It is uh, still a country that does not, it's not used to having a centralized government. It's a tribal country. Uh, the economy is still, after literally trillions of years, it is not unified. And, uh, and there's a level of corruption there that is just incredibly difficult for most Westerners to understand. The answer is yes. I do believe that, that uh, there will be a civil war. It may not uh, be tomorrow or the next year or two years from now before the country begins, uh, in a sense, to crumble, as you said. But uh, I believe within five years' time, we'll find ourselves with a uh, completely failed state and a safe haven, again, for those that want to attack us. You know, it's really tragic. I mean, 
I'm kind of jumping ahead in the book a little bit, but I know you refer to some of these little school uh, girls who were sprayed with acid uh, when you were in command there, in, and uh, they, that took place in Kandahar, I think. Uh, some of them blinded, some of them couldn't go back to school, and that was the intention of the attackers. Uh, I, it kind of breaks my heart that, I mean, along with the fight, American soldiers really struggled in those patrols that we were on to go into towns and villages and open schools and open roads and try to get healthcare clinics rolling. And part of that, the, the good news were kids flying kites, excuse my romanticism, but kids flying kites, which were banned under the Taliban, kids being allowed to go to school, girls being educated, starting to take a part in that society. And all of that now potentially rolls back. I, uh, I am deeply concerned about the human rights issue that I think we were going to see over the next several years. And you're absolutely right, Dana. You know, when, when we first went to that country, very few children actually went to school. It's less than a million. Uh, as we left it, it's more, uh, I think it's four times that now, with uh, more than half of them being women uh, or females. That potentially is all going to be lost. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, the last photo of that book, uh, I specifically chose to be the last photo. And it's a young soldier uh, from CJTF 101, one of our uh, ally, uh, one of our um, assigned troops. But anyway, he is actually giving some food to some young children, and they're laughing. And it wasn't staged; just was totally caught on camera uh, in the middle of a combat zone. And it's all about the children. And uh, I am deeply worried about the children of Afghanistan. You you talk about you know the goals of the. Uh, strategic plan for the war on terrorism. And you know something about that because you wrote in the book that you were you were uh, part of the group to publish the, the nation's first operational strategic plan for the war on terrorism and that you actually briefed President Bush on the plan. What, what yeah. was the goal? What was the headline? Well, the first goal was obviously to you know secure Afghanistan so it would never attack us again. The rest of the story, though, was is to actually do that. In those days, what we thought would be necessary is, is that you had to secure not only against the enemy but you or the insurgents or the terrorists, but you had to secure the people, make them feel like they could actually get up in the morning, work uh, for a decent wage, and send their kids to school, and then also to link them to their, uh, uh, their government. So really, three broad goals, security, basically, economic development that uh, uh, led to jobs, uh, and then education and medical uh, improvements. And then finally, linking all that back to a government that the Afghans could trust. That didn't go well, that last part, definitely. But look, you draw some interesting parallels with Vietnam as well. And your father, uh, he served in Vietnam? He served three tours in Vietnam, yes. And he never, you said in the book, never forgave politicians for walking away. Do you forgive politicians walking away today? You mentioned that the generals will be ultimately blamed, so you better have big big shoulders. And, and you also talked about the fact that, you know, they, they made the mistake of trying to hold everything rather than what was achievable in Vietnam. Did we just do the same in Afghanistan? Sorry, that's, I think a, that's a big question. Part. That's a great question, Dan, and I think it's going to be explored over the next couple of years. But I, I, I think that... If you look in the horizon, that's what it looks like. You know, I mean, in a sense, the parallels between uh, Afghanistan and Vietnam are are really uh, um, close. I mean, in some cases, you know, there was a government that was fairly corrupt, um, unclear how much, you know, it had been elected, how much of it was supported by the people. Uh, there was a very strong insurgent group that was, you know, pat pushing them. And then you had, you know, the United States and our allies. We forget that uh, we fought with many allies in, in uh, Vietnam. And when we left, and then finally two to three years later, two years later, when we dropped all basically budget support of financial support, it was no longer possible for that South Vietnamese government to basically survive. And essentially, what I hope does not happen, but it could, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm almost predicting that it might over, you know, five years time is the same thing in Afghanistan. You were told in deployment you had to succeed in two theaters of operations, Afghanistan and Pakistan. The latter was very gray, was it not? I mean, there were, were there clear, you know, orders to go forward into Pakistan or you kind of had to flirt along the, the border with Pakistan and sometimes carry out a, a drone strike in hot pursuit? 
absolutely gray area. You know, the guidance that we, we received was was fairly clear from my boss at the time, uh, General McKiernan. And, and yet most of the, the U.S. structure did not exist. Uh, you know, I, I make a point in Marathon War that I went to Pakistan with, uh, you know, my staff several times. And uh, over a period of time, we started with a terrible relationship. You know, they were basically supporting uh, insurgent attacks across our border. And we had a very bad uh, relationship military to military with them. I think over 15 months, as I write about Marathon War, I felt at the end of it that we had made huge progress. Obviously, you know, it was not enough. And you blame the ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Agency, is playing a double game. I absolutely do. In fact, I mean, I often think that many of the senior military officers that I dealt with from Pakistan actually didn't know the level that this ISI directorate was playing within their own country as well as within Afghanistan. So I can't point my finger to them, but it's very clearly it had support at the very highest levels of Pakistan. Yeah, and you make an interesting point in there because we often kind of say Pakistan does this or Pakistan didn't do this or Pakistan's playing a double game. But in fact, you made the case that it was pretty tough on the military, probably on the front lines of the border in Pakistan, because they weren't quite sure, you know, who had their back and, and who had a knife in their back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I think it's easy for us in the West and America to forget that this was actually a frontier. You know, Winston Churchill, I mentioned in the Marathon War that one of my favorite books was uh, The Malakan Field Force by Winston Churchill. You know, Lieutenant Winston, Winston Churchill, who served in that area back in, in those days. It was just as much a frontier uh, in the northwestern portions of Pakistan then as it is today, basically. And so they did not have all control as far as the U.S. Uh, or the uh, Pakistani military, for sure. It was a uh, there were several double games being played in that area. I dare say it's the same right now. I was, you know, in Afghanistan a dozen different times and I always used to hear it and it became cliche to some extent that, you know, the spring comes the bad guys come over the mountains from Pakistan, the Taliban, they carry out their attacks. Winter comes, the number of attacks go down again, and they, they retreat back into the frontier lands of Pakistan. But I remember flying in a helicopter with you over Afghanistan, and you said, you know, it's not quite clear to me that it quite operates that way. It's more complex than that. They smuggle weapons through the winter. They stock weapons ready for the spring. Some of them melt back into the local populations. And, and that is probably a much more realistic take on what was happening. And then you talk a lot, a lot about what happened in, and forgive me for the pronunciation, Wanat. Yes. Yeah, so for an example, well, Dan, first of all, I, you know, I treasure those times flying there with you. I mean, that was actually, it was, if you recall, it's a stunningly beautiful day, and uh, what a great way to see it by helicopter. You know, Afghanistan is a land of contrast, beautiful, and yet, uh, in many ways, it's, uh, it can be horribly dis uh, difficult to be able to survive in that country. Well, I tell you, you know, I mean, when you go, let's go to one night for an example, you know, uh, I mean, there were several lessons learned. It's still one of the most uh, studied stories uh, in the U.S. Uh, military, for sure. You know, the lessons that most of us learned there is, is that uh, that whether it was the winter, whether it was the late spring and the snows and stuff like that, but the enemy gets a foe and uh, and they can fight well as well. And they can uh, figure out ways to get around most of the things that we regard as military advantages in the West or in the U.S. Army. And uh, they did so in that fight. I mean, and, uh, you know, I, I, every day I wake up and, and think about those soldiers that were killed and those that were horribly wounded. Uh, they fought with a great honor, uh, but the enemy fought fairly well, too. And it was just a uh, uh, it's just an example of uh, how good uh, that that unit was that they actually the U.S. Uh, and it, uh, in the, the Afghans and the um, few Marines that were over there, that they actually uh, were able to fight that back and, and, and uh, overall hold that day. What makes that battle different? Like, and this is July 2008. Nine U.S. soldiers die in an attack by roughly 100 Taliban. There are a couple of dozen more, um, I think about 20 more U.S. soldiers wounded. And you write yes. that it is, it is, there are few battles as bloody and heroic. Yeah, so... Well, I mean, for Afghanistan, you know, I think that uh, 20 years of drudgery going out and patrolling, coming on back, getting a rocket attack, maybe uh, somebody else being hurt uh, via that way, that can just lead to this idea that uh, there was no great heroism in Afghanistan. In fact, there were several battles. This was the one most notable uh, where, you know, these soldiers fought and fought and fought against almost all odds and certainly against, uh, you know, they were definitely outnumbered. 
And uh, that's what makes that one, I think, a, a little bit special. I mean, there's no doubt about it that, uh, you know, the amount of awards, medals and things that came out of that for heroism is absolutely incredible for the 20 years of Afghanistan that we've seen. But you wrote this was well planned and that the, the enemy was probably well entrenched in that village and that the village worked with them and assisted them. Um, th this wasn't just a case of insurgents coming across the mountain. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's where we got it wrong. I mean, there's no doubt that uh, we made uh, the wrong decisions about what we thought were, was possible in that village. We actually thought we were going to insert fallen counterinsurgency um, doctrine at the time, get right inside the villagers and uh, and help them uh, do those three things. I mean, help secure them, help link them to the government and, and then help, uh, it, you know, uh, economically. Gosh, did we get it wrong? Um, you know, and, and that caused me to Dana, to take a hard look at everything else we were doing for the re remainder of the 12 months that we stayed there in Afghanistan, looked very, most of with a jaded view uh, into every village and every site that we had to just be see, did it make any sense for us to be there? A bit like Vietnam. And sh maybe this was the bellwether attack where kind of that coin approach where you go in, you spend some money, you help the locals, you try to win hearts and minds, and eventually they'll turn and push the Taliban out. I mean, increasingly, that wasn't the first village that became like that, was it? No. I mean, in fact, I mean, it, as you said, it may be in the bellwether, maybe in one of the first, but it happened uh, several times thereafter over the, you know, the following, really the following 10 years up until now. And uh, I think, you know, it, sometimes we can be accused. And in fact, I talk about it in the Marathon War about did we fight this war one year at a time? You know, in other words, a unit would come in, spend 12 to 15 months there and then shift out. And then you'd have to relearn everything and including the relationships with the locals, which, you know, sometimes could be very unclear. Um, I still wonder about that. I, you know, I, when I left there and when I wrote the book, I did not think that was the case. I think we tried very hard to study and learn from our predecessors. But, you know, the more I think about it and the more I, you know, look at some of the errors that we made in a war of this nature, that could still be one of the things that uh, are out there. You spoke of the enemy running rat lines. Can you tell me what were rat lines through that area and why didn't you stay? Because as a commander, uh, and I know you've been asked this before, but I'll ask you again. I mean, in the end, you closed down that base and you withdrew. Didn't that send the wrong message? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think I mentioned in Marathon War, it was a strategic decision at the time. I thought it was the right thing to do. But what I did do is, is I obviously I gave a, a media win, a strategic media win to the Taliban. And, or but to you, the but you knew. You knew that they were going to fire that. that. You knew that they were going to trumpet that. You, that you I, I absolutely did. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that, you know, over time, I made – that was not the decision I should have made. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think in, over time, did it make sense to stay in that village? No. Did it make sense to try to help those villagers who had basically, uh, you know, they left, gave that village on over to the insurgents, and only later did they uh, come back? Didn't make any sense to me to be able to try to work on the, you know, our counterterrorism strategy or our counterinsurgency because I didn't think we it would win. But when you make a choice of that nature, when you make a strategic choice, you really have got to weigh, you know, what are the options, and then think you know, a year in the future, think about two years in the future. And I, and I think, you know, it's funny when I was at Harvard, uh, you know, I took a course called thinking in time, great book out there, by the way, I probably didn't learn the lesson of thinking in time. I uh, should have thought two to three years later and, and thought about how that would impact our strategic stance inside of Afghanistan. You think it was a mistake to leave? It was a mistake. Yeah. I, I made a mistake there. And, you know, it's probably one, you know, just in life, Dana, you learn things and, uh, you know, for three or four years, you think you made the right choice. A decade later, when you look at it, sometimes you make some choices that are almost strategic in your life. And this one was strategic in, in yeah. the, you know, stance for the United States and our allies in Afghanistan. Well, Jeff, you know what? I mean, you're right. It'll be debated for years. And there's probably 50 percent class of commanders that would say, get the hell out because it wasn't defendable. And given limited resources, you should have left and you made the right decision. And maybe, maybe there would have been another nine soldiers killed in another attack there. And then there are those that will take that longer view and say, well, we don't want to be seen to be giving up ground. But, you know, I, 
I like your book because you speak, and I like you more after reading it because you speak about heroism, which we always hear about soldiers holding ground and charging the hill. And 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 I don't mean to to in any way uh, underestimate those great acts of valor, but you also speak of character and how important character is as a leader. And I think for any leader, this is a great book to read, just you know, whether you're a soldier or you're just any kind of a leader, even in corporate business about character. Um, but in the end, I didn't realize until I got to the end of your book, and it made me a bit sad today, that you decided in to leave the army uh, over that attack at the end because others were held responsible and you felt in the end you were at the top of the chain of command and you should bear ultimate responsibility for what happened there. Yeah. I mean, I, I get, I'm glad you brought that up. Dana. I mean, you know, uh, you know, one, I mean, uh, when I left and I, even today, I, I wake up in the morning and I miss being a soldier and I miss, you know, leading soldiers. And I think I say in marathon war there that uh, it was, you know, the remor- most rewarding part of my entire professional career. I definitely felt, though, that as when I came back from Afghanistan and found out that, uh, you know, three subordinate commanders who were actually one of them was awarded a silver star for heroism that day, the company commander, but they were being held, you know, for dereliction of duty. And I felt that that was absolutely wrong. And uh, I am a big believer in taking total responsibility, especially as a commander in combat. Uh, for everything that happens below me, whether it's good, bad, or whatever. Uh, you know, the good, I try to help uh, make people feel good about it themselves, push that to them, but the bad has to come to the commander. And uh, I made that point several different times to uh, my the senior leaders in the United States Army, uh, as well as in uh, at uh, Central Command. Uh, at the end of the day, I felt like as that pursued on, I had to uh, actually uh, make a statement. And the only way to really do that is was to was to choose to retire. And uh, I still do not regret that decision uh, at all. I do believe at the end of the day that the most important part of being a leader is actually character. And, uh, and I felt I had to uh, show some uh, by doing that. Well, you showed a lot. And uh, I think it's important to know that you were cleared by those investigations and you would have probably gone on to be promoted and maybe be commanding in Europe, U.S. forces. So um, you, you didn't you didn't talk character you 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 backed it up and showed it with with ultimate decisions but i wanted to ask you about general mckiernan who lost support of washington and was replaced at one point do you think that it was fair that generals again we come back to this the generals were blamed for the fight when there were you know they were constantly saying they were under resourced and underfunded um and then I'll, i'll ask you about that because a lot of people will debate that yeah. Well, so what I will say is, in my belief, and is, is that, you know, generals will be held responsible in almost every uh, war or every kind of um, incident-like war, even less war <laughs> conflict. And for right, so uh, rightly so, this is our profession, and uh, these are things that uh, that we spend years and years uh, learning about. We must, though. You you must always understand. I I think that you know at at very high levels. Uh, it is politicians uh, and our Congress that decides whether you're going to actually support a, a uh, endeavor of this nature, whether it's war or whether it's a minor conflict and stuff like that. And so we go hand in hand. And uh, uh, should generals be blamed? Absolutely. Do I take responsibility for my portion? Absolutely. I sure do. Um, but it, just as we see now, this is a political decision for us to withdraw our troops. Um, and at the time when we served, there was a political decision to uh, underfund, as far as resources, Afghanistan so that the Iraq and the Iraqi surge could be supported. You know, it was my responsibility to call that out. And eventually I had to do it publicly, if you recall. I mean, I, I told you what I was saying as we would fly, you know, that, that I was going public as far as a need for uh, more resources. And uh, um that takes also a little bit of character. It takes a little bit of moral courage, which I talk about in Mar- Mar- Marathon War too. It's not always popular to ask for more uh, when your area is not regarded as the number one priority. And you were briefing, you just weren't talking to reporters. I mean, you were briefing a young senator named Barack Obama, and then you were also briefing the president at the time, President Bush, and you write about that in the book. But, you know, in the end, when you read, I 
I went back and read it because sometimes Iraq and Afghanistan kind of melds together on some of these numbers, but 800 billion in US spent in Afghanistan, at one point more than 100,000 troops deployed, is that really under resourcing? At the time when uh, we were there, there weren't that many troops. And uh, I will say that in, nor were the, the financial resources there. Over time, we did put that in. And, and I think it's, it's, it's right for American people and people that are interested in national security to say, well, at what point was that enough enough? Um, and uh, I think somewhere along the line there, there must have been enough troops. I think the biggest issue for that is if you look back in time is, is that we, we chose to make a different choice within about two years time and we started to, to withdraw troops to a fairly significant level. We still continued to support financially for a very long time Afghanistan and there's literally been now trillions put into Afghanistan. I think it's a really great question to sit there and look and say when is enough enough in a conflict like this where it's not our number one na uh, nation's priority, especially now, uh, and yet it still is important. It's a national security interest, you know, and, and what yeah. do you need uh, to- And do uh, you to, and do you need to be at war and do you need to withdraw? And are those the, two, the only choices that you have in your spectrum? Because General Petraeus, for instance, will tell you that, uh, you know, any place you leave a gap or a vacuum right now in the war of terror, it will be feel, filled by extremism. Uh, and you will dangerously harvest the result of that down the road. So we keep troops in North Africa. We keep special yeah. forces all over the world. Why wouldn't we keep a minimal force in Afghanistan? There's only 2,500 soldiers there right now. So it's Absolutely. not like this big force contingent, nothing like what you commanded at the time. Why wouldn't we keep 2,500 soldiers on the ground training Afghan forces, forward air controllers, you know, helping them at some point carry out airstrikes if they have to defend the government? Well, I think that that, you know, a lot of people are asking that question right now, especially those that, uh, you know, have worked or, in, you know, been in Afghanistan and report in Afghanistan. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, look, uh, you know, for national security interests, we still have troops in Germany and Japan and Korea uh, and in places that love much lesser troops, but in places that are still important to us, JTF Bravos in Honduras. How many Americans know that we have a couple thousand troops down there and have had for decades? We do this around the world when our national interests are actually, you know, considered important in that area of the world. I, I, you know, I, I would also say, Dana, you know, people ought to take a hard look at, at Afghanistan and try to find it on a map. You know, uh, if, if China's a priority to us, what country do we have troops in right now that actually butts up to China on a land mass? It's Afghanistan. You know, I mean, uh, what country is located in between Iran, which is a national security priority for us? And then, of course, you know, our pending or upcoming allies in India and uh, nuclear powered states like Afghanistan or Pakistan and India. It's Afghanistan. You know, I mean, uh, it is a, it is a strategically important place yes. and uh, much less the counterterrorism issues in Iraq. Draw a parallel with Iraq right. because we left Iraq and then suddenly. ISIS moved in, took over the north, took over Mosul, where you were based earlier yeah. in your career in Iraq, established a caliphate. Um, and in yeah. the end, U.S. forces are back and NATO forces had to go back in there and the, the, the British, the, the French bombing missions. And uh, I mean, this may be very short term, this bringing American troops home from Afghanistan. We'll see. You know, I mean, uh, Iraq's one example of what happens, you know, the attack on the second largest city, Mosul, one that we know, and it's, that is, you know, thousands and thousands of years old. Um, or is the example, and we chose to come back in because of the nature of that. Or could it be like Vietnam, where we just, you know, we basically uh, shake our hands and said, at the end of Vietnam, we said, okay, we're done. And, uh, you know, and two years later, it was absolutely, uh, you know, it was invaded by uh, North Vietnamese uh, conventional divisions. I don't know which parallel to follow. I don't know which example is going to happen. I do know, though, it's going to be important for America. Jeff, last word to you on Afghanistan and your, and your book. I mean, I've, laid, I've tried to lead you through it a little bit, and uh, it's, it's a good read. And, and I think you begin to understand uh, as a reader, that conflict and how tricky it was. And I, I was moved by a lot of the moments in there, such as ramp ceremonies, where your book is peppered with, with these, these moments where American soldiers uh, 
uh, are loaded, who have been killed in battle, are, are honored at a ramp ceremony on an aircraft before flown home with the American flag and with soldiers who served along with them. By the way, we were not allowed to cover those ramp ceremonies under the Bush administration because they didn't want us to show American losses. And in the end, I think we showed a Canadian ramp ceremony because we, we had to talk about losses. But, um, you know, there was always this PR effort that was that was going on. Uh, you know, are we winning? Are we losing? And over simplistic views on on how the Afghan war was was being fought and what was victory. And I think in the end, you know, it was going to be a 20 year counterinsurgency fight. And a lot of people knew that certainly in the military. I don't know if the politicians ever did. But last word to you. Sorry. You know, it's funny about the ramp ceremony is, is that those were some of the most memorable times of my life and yet the most challenging to get through. I mean, uh, we lost 180 soldiers and Marines, sailors and airmen while we were there, uh, including also uh, some civilians from our intelligence agencies. And uh, almost each and every day or night, we would have a ramp ceremony uh, for those uh, to honor them. And people would come out from all over. With Most of them were at Bagram Airfield. They would come out and uh, whether it was two o'clock in the morning, they'd line the streets as a Humvee with a coffin would go by to take it to the ceremony itself. And, um, you know, war is not a bloodless effort. War, if it's important enough for people to put their tre national treasure in it, you're going to have some losses. But you have to honor the people that served there. Just like right now, as we, um, as we get ready to leave Afghanistan, let's not, uh, you know, leave all those people that actually gave their, uh, their time, their selfless service. In some cases, they gave the last full measure of their life. Let's not forget them. And there was not another attack on America while U.S. forces were on the ground there. There's not. There's not been. Jeff Schlosser, retired Major General, commanded the 101st Airborne. Read the book Marathon War. And Jeff, thank you so much for your time. And Dan, thanks for the time this morning. And that's our backstory on Afghanistan. What a complex puzzle American commanders faced fighting insurgents and corruption in the Afghan government and challenges of a drug trade linked to terrorist networks that hit and then ran and struck again, killing civilians and soldiers with no regard for lives lost. The Taliban carried out those attacks, and Al-Qaeda, and ISIS too. Afghan warlords all vied for power, but were reluctant to disarm and work together in a united Afghan government. Stir in Iran, and Pakistan, and others. And it's no wonder the war lasted 20 years. And as US and allied Western countries pull out, the war won't stop. The Taliban will try to dominate and rule the country, as the Mujahideen did after the Russians left Afghanistan in 1989. Chaos followed the Russian pullout. And I wish I was wrong, but it's sure to follow this American one too. Thanks for listening to Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis, and I'll talk to you again soon.